Welcome back 4061ers. This lecture will begin our discussion of inter-process communication mechanisms that are present in Unix. Uh, that's IPC for short. A few announcements before we get underway. If you're reading along at home, then you'll be wanting to look at Stevens and Rago chapter 15. The first portion of this actually deals with several IPC mechanisms we've already discussed, and we'll review them in our first exercise associated with this lecture. You'll also want to have a look at the Dining Philosopher's Problem in some form. The Wikipedia article on this is fairly good, and uh, since we'll be spending a fair amount of time in this lecture discussing that model problem for interprocess cooperation and communication, uh, then you'll probably want a little reading material associated with it. Stevens and Rego are lacking this, uh, as it's a more... Uh, not so much a Unix central, but uh, Unix centric, but more of a classic uh, theoretical problem. Uh, but you can write implementations of it in Unix, and knowing the background associated with the problem is useful there. The TAs want to be to remind you that there's a protocol established uh, when you would want your quiz grades updated. Uh, and you'll want to have a look at the pinned Piazza post uh, to see what that protocol is. Uh, it's mentioned over here, up at the top, uh, the quiz regrades. Uh, so follow the instructions there if you want to guarantee that you get some credit back on your quiz. Uh, otherwise, uh, there are no guarantees. Just as in Homework 9, if the client or server that's communicating across a FIFO, if it disobeys the protocol that's been established uh, and goes out of turn, it may cause problems for the communication between those two. Uh, so have a look also at the Homework 9 uh, sets of code to see an interesting use of FIFOs uh, that will probably come back around in our final project of the semester. Uh, the big news that if uh, you are looking at this slide and looking for all CAPS announcements, is that I've decided that we are just not going to have the time prior to exam two to do a second project. To that end, uh, P2 is canceled, more or less, and we will shift the weight that was associated with that project to the final project instead. We'll probably call that one project two, because it's the second one that you're going to do. Uh, but that one is in relatively good shape and will be released uh, shortly after the exam. On the exam front, oh, uh, one other mention on that. If you did poorly on uh, project one, there will be some chances to get makeup credits in the final project. Some additional features you can add to the little chat bot implementation that we're going to do there uh, that will allow you to get some credit back for the previous project. Finally then, exam two, which is up next week, is going to focus instead, since we didn't have a project, on the homework, the lab, and the lecture materials, which I think is going to serve uh, very well in order for us to have lots to, to examine on. We will spend Monday reviewing and Wednesday doing the actual exam. The Monday review will take the form of a practice exam, so you can get used to the online format for that exam. Uh, and we will generally run that prax exam uh, during the first part of lecture and then the second part uh, I will be around to review answers to it uh, and to discuss comments. Uh, but be, pre be preparing for your Wednesday exam uh, next week. All right, for the moment, uh, let us turn to our goals, which are generally uh, to establish uh, the basic IPC mechanisms that you've seen and the ones that we have yet to fill in. Uh, these are things like semaphores, message queues, and shared memory blocks. There are a few other oddities in there, including uh, mutexes uh, that we'll get to later on in discussion of threads, which aren't inter-process communication anymore, they're within process communication. Uh, but uh, generally, we're always through this going to have to establish not just what to do with these, but how to use them uh, to allow for forward progress to be made by cooperating uh, processes. And that's generally going to come down to this more ephemeral notion of a protocol, as in who's doing what uh, when with the various tools that are on the table here. The first sort of pass at this is just to look back a little bit and see what the inter-process communication mechanisms we've studied so far are. We have looked at several of these, and a good way to characterize them uh, will be to identify how they're typically used and any restrictions you have on their use. Uh, for instance, if two processes need to communicate, how do they have to be related or what do they have to know about each other and what can they communicate to one another uh, through the IBC mechanisms that we've discussed. Take a moment and recall these for yourself. There are at least three to four that we've talked about. Uh, and since we've emphasized them earlier in the class, you can expect they'd show up come exam time in some form. 
that should be long enough to pause for those who are interested uh, and for those who just want to get spoiled. Uh, here are answers that I think uh, I would list in the uh, set of stuff that we've studied in terms of IPC. Uh, we actually saw an early form of IPC in the form of pipes. Uh, and this showed up in our first project where one process, a parent process, was able to communicate with a child process by opening up a pipe, uh, forking off a child, and having the child write into that pipe. Uh, the parent was able to then get data of an arbitrary form between, uh, from the child. The important restriction there is that those two processes had to be directly related, as in parent and child. Uh, with a little bit more work, you can have a parent set up two children that talk to each other through a pipe. Uh, this was the subject of an exam problem, actually. Uh, but generally, pipes are restricted in that you have to have two processes uh, that are very closely related in the process hierarchy in order to make use of them. FIFOs were like pipes, except they had this named position on the file system. They're being studied in the homework right now. It should be apparent that you don't need to have such a close relationship between processes then. They can be quite distant, even in different terminals, uh, for that matter, which puts them far apart in the hierarchy of processes. On the other hand, they do have to know the names of the FIFOs there. And so any processes that would be communicating there, uh, they have to be given names uh, for where the file is going to be on the file system. Uh, that could happen either by using a well-known name, uh, as is the case of uh, here's a server and has a well-known FIFO that clients write their data into. And the homework is demonstrating one other way that they can get that name is in, in the requests that clients send to the server, they can also then name response FIFO associated with it. But generally then, uh, this alleviates the need for two processes to be related in any particular way, so long as they know the names for those file positions for the FIFOs. Signals were another uh, mechanism that we discussed earlier on. Uh, they allow a limited form of message to be sent. And generally these are numbered messages. Uh, and every process has some sort of a default response to those, oftentimes just to die and sometimes to write their core memory uh, for debugging purposes. And primarily signals are used uh, for process control to either signal uh, that a process should die gracefully or ungracefully, uh, that it should stop, that it should continue, and so forth. There isn't actually a lot of data that can be transmitted through signals, uh, just the signal number, more or less. Uh, it's even problematic to find out who sent you a uh, signal. Uh, you have to invoke the signal handling routines and signal uh, handler uh, sort of setup code in a more complex fashion than we studied. It's possible, certainly, uh, but there are a lot of restrictions on that front. Primarily, though, if you want to send a signal, uh, the only thing you need to know is who you're sending it to in the form of a process ID. So the kill uh, system call and kill shell utility uh, generally can be invoked with a process ID and then a signal number. There are a few variants on the command line. For instance, uh, pkill allows you to name a program uh, to try and kill, but be careful because it'll kill all such instances on a program. Generally, signals are not good for general purpose communication. Pipes are better in that front because pipes allow arbitrary bytes to be sent back and forth versus signals can only send uh, sort of the number associated with the signal. Finally then, uh, it's probably worthwhile just to mention that files are a very useful way of communicating between two processes. Uh, we've seen that open files can be shared by several processes. There's some coordination uh, overhead associated with that, that uh, opening in a certain way will cause the data written to that file by, to be overwritten by another process. Uh, and so you'll have to take care to open things in the proper way. We'll actually revisit that way uh, to ensure that two processes don't clobber each other. Generally, there's less coordination provided by the operating system out of the box than there is for pipes. And so if one process is writing a file and another is reading, uh, you'll have to do some work in order to get that there. Uh, we've also seen that memory map files are possible uh, to share uh, so that the changes written by one file can be seen via an in-memory uh, image uh, by another process. Uh, and this will serve as the crux to establish shared memory blocks that are going to be a subject of discussion later on in this lecture uh, series, probably in our next session together. So we've seen actually quite a bit of IPC uh, previously, uh, but we're now in a position to talk about some additional bells and whistles for coordination and also to discuss a model problem associated with these things. Uh, a few notes in general on IPC. 
Um, there are limits to what signals and FIFOs can do, uh, and generally they allow some uh, transfer of information between unrelated processes. Uh, but there is not much in the way of synchronization between those processes. And so it can be very difficult to determine who's doing what at any given moment while you're communicating via signals. FIFOs have a little bit better uh, sort of coordination in that the operating system serializes any writes and reads to and from FIFOs. Uh, however, you still potentially need a way to allow one uh, process uh, to be reading from it at a time so that uh, it is able to read out the correct stuff and not read out stuff that was intended for another process if there's only a single FIFO. Uh, so to that end, most operating systems provide a number of IPC coordination mechanisms. They usually do this in some sort of a communication library, and we'll see that there are several primitives built into the standard IPC library in Unix. Uh, these include semaphores, uh, message queues, and shared memory. Semaphores are this interesting little device that have essentially a counter, and oftentimes this will be a counter of zero or one, uh, and a wait queue that allows coordination. And the atomic part of this is that as processes compete to try to acquire the semaphore, only one of them is going to be allowed at a time to decrement it, and semaphores are not allowed to go below zero. So these will form uh, the basis for a simple sort of efficient lock that uh, processes try to acquire it, and if they can't, they go into the wait queue and get their turn eventually when whoever has the semaphore decremented uh, increments it again. From this, uh, we can build several other things, uh, and we'll see that uh, there's a sort of equivalent between a data structure uh, along with a semaphore uh, that you can establish things like message queues there, although out of the box, Unix provides these in several forms, uh, and so they provide a nice directish way to communicate between processes that'll be uh, covered in our next lecture together. Finally, uh, we'll look at the ability to just establish shared blocks of memory uh, that can be written and read by two processes. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the MMAP business allows you to set this up uh, with fair ease. Uh, but figuring out uh, where to put that data, whether it's in a file or in an anonymous block, uh, that's a capability we have yet to develop. And certainly one would need to establish some way to coordinate the use of this memory because there's nothing inherent in there that allows you to do it. Semaphores and mutexes are often done for this. Uh, so there are two broad flavors of IPC that provide semaphores, message queues, and shared memory. Uh, they are uh, the older and so much more clunky System 5 IPC, uh, and the somewhat newer uh, but less well-known POSIX IPC. So both of these are libraries, and they serve to provide the semaphores, the message queues and the shared memory capabilities that were mentioned earlier. So there's uh, semaphores, message queues, and uh, shared memory in System 5 IPC and in POSIX IPC. We'll favor the POSIX IPC uh, for the following reason. Uh, first, a few historical notes on System 5, uh, which might make you think, oh, that looks like a good way but to, to do it. Uh, that most systems actually have System IPC. Uh, but generally, this was an early attempt to characterize those semaphores, message queues, and uh, shared memory blocks. And so it's a bit clunky uh, to use. There's these weird notions of namespaces uh, and uh, sort of file handle things that, are, that show up, um, which are kind of weird. Uh, on the other hand, POSIX, in order to identify where are those shared semaphores and shared memory blocks and so forth, they generally use the file system uh, to great effect on that. And this is in line with the Unix philosophy of uh, use the file system for just about everything possible. Uh, we've seen already that this doesn't always involve files. For instance, putting a FIFO on the file system puts a name for something that is essentially an internal piece of storage for the operating system, an internal communication buffer uh, out there. It's not really a file, doesn't occupy any space on the file system so much. Uh, instead, it just uh, gives a handle for uh, programs to easily identify some resource that's uh, publicly available. Uh, so a few other things about System 5. It's part of some Unix standards, although it's an optional standard. Just about every Unix implementation uh, implements it. And most textbooks, uh, including our Stevens and Rago and Robbins and Robbins, uh, uh, they talk about System 5 just because the textbook writers uh, probably uh, were coming up as programmers at a time when this was the only game in town. 
The more recent development in POSIX IPC, though, uh, it has this sort of nicer character to it, and the examples that I'll provide will, in the slides at least, be mostly there. There are equivalent examples as uh, in System 5 and a subdirectory that you can examine if you're interested. Um, we have taught at times this class using System 5 IPC, but there's enough resources in Robbins and Robbins uh, to discuss this, uh, and it's newer and probably the sort of thing that will persist into the future farther. So um, we'll focus our attention there. So just to sort of uh, summarize then, there are two major libraries out there that provide this in Unix. Uh, and on that front, the system services that you, that you get then, and the example you see out there, um, they come with some variety. So as you would be Googling for code on IPC, you'll have to be aware, am I looking at something that's written in this older System 5 IPC style, uh, using different sets of function calls and so forth, uh, and, or am I reading uh, using something that's in uh, the POSIX uh, realm instead? There are both going to be semaphores and uh, message queues and shared memory blocks there between these, and as you Google for something like Unix semaphore, chances are likely that you'll hit these System 5 things rather than the POSIX stuff, uh, for example. So be careful on that front. All right, to our model problem. Uh, this is the classic dining philosopher's problem. Uh, the statement for it is uh, done sort of coyly uh, in the following link uh, that's attributed to uh, mainly Aditya uh, Bhargava, although I think the, uh, the diagrams here are coming from another fellow, uh, Justin, uh, Dustin R uh, Darnault, uh, instead. Uh, but you'll see a character, if you've ever watched a show called Parks and Rec, called Ron Swanson. And if there's one thing you'll learn early about Ron Swanson, he's a no-nonsense guy, and he eats a lot. Uh, there's a sort of venue there in which um, folks go for breakfast food, and Swanson is a fan of eggs. And so uh, in this emulation of that dining philosopher's problem, uh, the statement is generally that these folks are seated at a table and an arrangement with five of them around, as it were, and due to a fork shortage, uh, there is only one fork sitting in between each of the individuals here. Uh, so you can see there are five Swansons and five forks. Now, this is where the analogy breaks down just a little bit because most folks will say that's great. Everybody picks up a fork and starts eating. <laughs> Uh, and where we have to start introducing some constructions for the model problem to make it interesting. Uh, Ron Swanson will only ever eat with two forks, and this is so he can stuff his face faster with eggs, uh, something that's very important to him. This makes a little more sense if you actually go to the dining philosophers, uh, the, the proper form of this, where you have, uh, see, I think I have some Wikipedia pictures up here someplace uh, of this stuff. Oh, yeah, um, that's uh, in the actual incarnation, uh, this was philosophers uh, sitting around a table and there were chopsticks on the table, not forks. This makes a lot more sense because anyone who's ever tried to eat with chopsticks realizes eating with one chopstick is nigh impossible uh, and eating with two is much more palatable. So the philosophers would actually pick up both chopsticks so that they could actually eat uh, the rice bowl or noodles uh, that were in the middle. Forks, on the other hand, are much more useful on their own, but uh, you'll see that there are a large number of folks with diagrams around here that favor the you know, forks part, including the Wikipedia article, which has uh, historical philosophers with forks. Uh, historical philosophers, ah, now this time they actually got the chopsticks. I should probably update my graphic to this one. That, that makes a little bit more sense. Uh, but anyway, um, bear with me then. So uh, each of these individuals needs two forks. So generally then, uh, each of them is going to try and pick up the forks. Uh, as our instance, this lower right individual is going to try and get the left fork and the right fork, and if he gets them, uh, then he'll eat. On the other hand, uh, this uh, individual is going to get the left fork and the right fork for him, uh, and then attempt to begin eating. Uh, so one arrangement here is that everyone grabs for forks, uh, and you have two folks that actually have two forks and are able to eat. Uh, they eat for a while, and then put their forks back down to consider how awesome they are. Uh, and on the other hand, some folks might end up with no forks because they're not quite quick enough, and others might end up with one fork uh, between them, uh, but that's not good enough to, to, to proceed. Um, so this is the model problem, and it's a problem that involves attempts to coordinate the activities of these five folks. 
uh, we will want to study some algorithms that allow several facets here to, 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 to be true about this. That um, if these philosophers, uh, Swansons as they were, uh, are going to follow sort of the standard operating procedure, uh, then they'll eat for a while, they'll put their forks down, they'll wait for a little while, and then they'll attempt to eat again by picking up forks. Uh, generally, uh, we want to come up with some algorithm that allows everybody to eventually get fed uh, and avoids any fisticuffs uh, in fightings over forks. So the exercise that's laid out for you then, uh, based on this, uh, is to come up with some sort of a protocol uh, that would allow uh, each of the Swansons to eventually eat, uh, therefore avoid starvation, but also avoid deadlock. Uh, and deadlock is this uh, phenomena in which everyone is doing something, but they're stuck because the instructions that they're following allow no one to make any forward progress. Uh, and therefore, the algorithm or the group as a whole um, isn't able to move forwards. Um, so I would like, if you mind, don't mind, a pause for a few minutes and think about this. Um, how would you have the Swansons uh, determine which forks to pick up? If they pick up forks and uh, pick up a fork and can't get it, what would you have them do with that fork? Uh, and keep in mind then this drive to move folks forwards, as in everyone gets to eat eventually uh, some eggs, uh, and that any sort of protocol you'd establish for what sh each of these individuals should be doing at a time uh, should try to prevent uh, each of them making a decision that overall hurts the group by getting them to some form of deadlock. Take a few minutes, think this over, and then we'll go forwards to look at some answers for it. Spoilers in three, two, one, zero. Generally then, Every one of the Swanses is going to have to pick up a fork. An obvious solution is just to encode, say, every Swanson try to pick up the left fork first. Uh, so this individual, as they face me, would pick up their left-hand fork, so that's this. Uh, and this would go in then a clockwise fashion. Uh, this individual is to their left is over here, left, left over here, this tries to pick up this, this fork. So everybody uh, has sort of like attempts to pick up their left-hand fork. The obvious problem with this uh, is that if everyone first picks up their left fork and has it in hand uh, and then looks to their right, uh, they'll find an empty spot. And this could lead very easily to deadlock where everyone has one fork in hand, they're not releasing it, and there's no way to pick up a second fork. Uh, so to that end, deadlock is a major danger in that front. Uh, and this is our, our first sort of like uh, uh, clue that we need to do something slightly more complex than that. Uh, one possible way uh, to do that is to say, well, if you pick up a fork and you can't get the other fork, just put your fork back down. Um, theoretically, uh, this could uh, lead to a so-called live lock where everyone picks up their left fork uh, and can't get their right fork. So they put down their left fork again and then they try again, pick up their left fork, can't get their right fork because everyone's doing this synchronously. And you have this notion of a live lock in which everyone's doing something, but no one is ever making any forward progress uh, and the group suffers. They're essentially uh, live locked at the same state and as a group not making any progress. Um, so a first and very important like, development on this front uh, is just to say we need to break this cycle somehow because this cycle of uh, each individual attempting to acquire some resources uh, on their own, uh, this is what's leading to trouble. So uh, Dijkstra, one of the godfathers of computer science, uh, proposed the following uh, very you know, simple modification to this. Break that cycle by having some Swanson uh, go right instead of left. Uh, and so if we have uh, this individual up here going left, uh, we'll pick one of the folks over here to go right first instead. So uh, everybody here attempts to get their left fork first, except this one uh, who tries to get the rightmost fork first. Uh, on that front, then, there'll be contention that this individual and this individual both want the same fork. Only one of them can acquire it. It's whoever is quicker in, in that regard. Uh, but that leaves open, then, uh, the fact that uh, this individual isn't contending for that fork initially. And if we obey protocol that you have to acquire your first fork first, uh, that's the left one for this guy and the right one for this guy, if this one fails uh, to get that, uh, then uh, this uh, individual will have that available, uh, and this individual uh, will have easy access to their right fork because this one hasn't gotten um, the, the, the uh, right fork first. 
And we'll just sit there waiting to acquire that first fork on, uh, first. All right, on the other hand, this guy picks up that fork, uh, and then this one is stuck waiting for the left fork, and that leaves this fork over here immediately available on to this one. Uh, and so the cycle is broken. Generally, Dijkstra's like, theoretical answer to this is that anytime you have uh, some sort of a contended set of resources over here, you establish a partial ordering uh, for this. Uh, as in, it's not cyclic anymore, it's a, some sort of a DAG structure of some kind. Uh, and this, if you can prove that there's a partial ordering for research, uh, resource acquisition, uh, then there won't be any cycles possible and you uh, are proven to avoid deadlock. Uh, that doesn't necessarily deal with the starvation aspect of this. Uh, and that's, it could be that this, some poor Swanson who's constantly trying to get a fork but just not quick enough before it uh, gets starved. Uh, generally, probabilistically, this doesn't happen too often. But in order to guarantee it, you need to introduce somewhat more complex solutions. Uh, the notion of a priority for fork ownership based on how long it's been since you had a fork last. Uh, this is beyond the scope of what we're going to discuss at the moment because, practically speaking, uh, we won't face any problems at this point uh, that really um, contend with issues like that. Uh, so, but if you are interested, uh, I'd turn you on to the Shandy Misra solution that's covered in the Wikipedia article uh, on the Dining Philosophers. Uh, you introduce some count associated with Swanson's and forks uh, that indicates how long it's been since I was actually able to get a fork, uh, and that. Uh, is then affects like how what your likelihood of getting a fork is if it, I haven't had one for a long time my priority goes up and that means if we're both contending for it the lower or the individual with the higher priority gets it uh, which will prevent starvation. So then uh, let's talk a little bit about coordination mechanisms of how you can uh, sort of emulate in code this idea that two folks are contending for the same resource but only one could acquire them. Uh, this comes uh, from an old word, uh, semaphore, uh, that's generally some sort of a signal, uh, oftentimes used on railway lines, uh, to indicate whether it's safe for one train to proceed. Uh, you can envision this is uh, very necessary when there's only a single train track and there's two directional traffic here. Usually coming up on stretches like that, uh, there'll be some two track instance, but then a semaphore here controls one direction, whether it's safe to proceed or if there's a train coming from the other direction, you should wait patiently on the second track until that one passes by. Uh, so these semaphores then uh, are also coming up uh, in flags uh, on Navy ships, if I remember right there. A primitive way to communicate uh, way back in naval history before we had electronic communications and still used at times if there's a breakdown in naval communications. You'll see folks uh, raising flags to mean certain symbols uh, or, or so on. But uh, the important thing here is uh, relates back to the train uh, part of this, which is uh, there's an area in here in which we're only going to allow one thing through because it's only safe uh, for one thing to traverse that area. And that's the notion of an atomic operation, that there's only one thing occupying or a safe number of things occupying some region at a moment. Uh, this is oftentimes associated with a shared resource of some kind. And in this case, we have these uh, sort of ma imaginary forks or chopsticks or what have you uh, that need to be shared. Uh, there's only one of them uh, that can be acquired by the individuals there. Uh, and so we can only allow one process uh, to acquire that resource and get through it. We'll also see that semaphores uh, can be used to protect critical regions of code. Uh, we've already discussed this a little bit in the context of signal handling, where uh, if you are using a shared resource such as a system call that has global memory, uh, then there's the danger, even within one process, of both the process's main code and a signal handler touching that stuff. And so one way to protect that is to just not put any unsafe code in signal handlers. This is much recommended. Uh, but another way is to block signals during a cri critical region. We'll see that critical regions are much more often protected using uh, semaphores or mutexes to allow only one process or executable entity like a thread uh, through it. And it's used to coordinate then access uh, along those. So we'll have a look at how this plays out specifically in the uh, sort of dining philosophers situation.
I'd encourage you at this point, because the next exercise is to examine code, is to actually get that code. If you haven't downloaded the code pack for this particular instance, uh, then have a look at the philosopher's posix.c file that's posted on uh, our course uh, web area. Uh, just punching that link will get you over here uh, to have a look at it. Because the nature of this activity is to, just to walk through that code and have a look uh, to see what the POSIX semaphore code actually looks like. How you create one, how you acquire and release them once you have them in hand, uh, and what happens when multiple processors modify the same semaphore. Uh, this important sort of aspect of, of it is something that uh, is going to sort of pay dividends in terms of coordination mechanism. Uh, finally, then, uh, how are semaphores used to coordinate use of forks? And I don't mean the system call forks here. I mean, in this specific case of the dining philosophers, uh, how is it that they emulate this notion of forks? And finally, how is deadlock avoided in this specific code? I'll give you a second to pause and call up that code. Otherwise, uh, we'll go through it together in just a moment. All right, uh, that's probably long enough for those of you who wished you to pause and have a look. And for those of you who are looking for spoon feeding, uh, but you're about to get it. Uh, be, keep in mind that this uh, notion of semaphores is covered in also in the Unix manual pages. So it's worthwhile maybe to look at an online or a, a local copy of that main page, the sem overview over here. I'll give you my two cents on it as, as we look through it. Let me pull up the code. Uh, let's see, I think I have that here. Yeah, and let me put some line numbers up so that we have there. Uh, I should mention that uh, there might be subtle differences between this code and what's up online right now because I discovered um, some bugs in here that I always seem to introduce ahead of, uh, as students ask me to make modifications live, I, I do it and then forget to undo them. Uh, but that shouldn't affect our discussion here too greatly. The first signs of this semaphore business uh, show up here as a global variable uh, that's present, uh, this semt utensils um, uh, variable. And the semt here, that should be a strong sign that this is some sort of a data structure. Uh, I have a bunch of pointers to these, so it'll be an array of pointers. And so if you're not familiar with the C parlance here, this is definitely an array, but the contents of it are these uh, sem, uh, point, semt pointers. Uh, and this will be the array of semaphores that I use. You can see that uh, up here I have a pound fine for five philosophers, and I have uh, the array named utensils and five elements uh, that are within it. Uh, there are a couple other global variables here, how many meals to finish and what's the max delay. We'll see how those play out uh, uh, later on. Uh, down here, uh, there is a philosopher function uh, with an int n. Uh, we'll have to uh, have a look at that at, at some point, uh, but it's generally going to be the work that philosophers do of eating and thinking about how awesome they are and then eating again. On that one. Uh, so as we move into main then, uh, what you see through here uh, is that uh, there's also an array of uh, PIDTs uh, that are the philosophers. And this should trigger sort of some instincts that I'm probably going to fork off some child processes on this front. Uh, and on that front, uh, yeah, that, that's exactly the direction that we're heading. That this parent process here is going to emulate the philosophers by creating five child processes, each of them executing that philosopher function. Uh, and they'll be acquiring the resources represented by those um, the semaphores uh, and the forks. Uh, but it'll be the parent process that sits in the back and waits for all of this uh, to finish. You can see then uh, that play out uh, in parts down here. Uh, if you look a little lower, uh, you'll see a fork down here, uh, as in not forking uh, as in uh, something to eat with, but instead uh, the fork system call in this case, uh, too many forks abounding here. And this parent process is going to spin up five philosopher children and start them off running this philosopher uh, function, uh, giving them uh, indexes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, so they knew uh, where they are seated at the table. Uh, the parent process, meanwhile, is going to keep track of those PIDs and simply wait until the end of it. Uh, before doing that, though, uh, there is this setup over here in which those uh, semaphores are established. And so let's look for just a moment at the conventions associated with this. Interestingly, most semaphores and POSIX need a name. 
Uh, there's a, just a mild rule to the naming of that, that they have to start with a slash. Uh, I'm not sure entirely of what the reason is for this, but I know it will fail on some systems if you don't start it up with the slash. So I need to establish a name, and I'll just name these 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, that's after the philosophers uh, themselves, uh, philosophers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It'll essentially be uh, a name for the utensil or fork that's in between of those philosophers. Uh, then, uh, the main action for this then is uh, done via this sem open uh, functionality. Uh, so you can see a number of uh, interesting things here, and if you look at this at a high level, it looks very much like a file open. Uh, and As in, this is a name for something, and you see a familiar o create flag here, uh, along with permissions. Uh, that looks almost exactly like just the open system call. And this is by design. Uh, that's what folks learn from their early earlier forays into uh, the system, uh, so the IPC mechanisms, is that if you make these things look like files and give them positions on the file system, uh, that simplifies a large number of things. Um, and so it's intentional that this looks like a file open. What it's really doing though is allocating an internal resource in the file, or sorry, in the operating system uh, that is one of these semaphores uh, that can act to coordinate between uh, multiple processes trying to acquire the same resource. Uh, it is then the case uh, that I uh, just need to uh, initialize each of those uh, semaphores. Uh, there are a few options to be passed in there. They're not of great uh, utility uh, or not of great significance right now, but most importantly, uh, you do need to indicate that they're shared between any processes uh, that would acquire them. Uh, so they're not unique in that, that respect. Uh, importantly then, uh, one of the interactions between syscalls we see here is that on opening them in the parent process, which happens once and in initializing them, all of the forked processes, the children, they inherit and see these up here. It'll turn out other processes could also acquire these, uh, but for the moment it's enough just to see that uh, the child processes inherit this shared resource. Uh, and unlike other kinds of variables, uh, this system level resource of se uh, uh, semaphores, it's not copied between the processes. Instead, they're all looking at the same set of semaphores. So then, uh, all that happens after that in main is to wait for all the children to finish uh, and then do a little bit of stuff that we'll talk about later to clean up uh, the semaphores. For the moment, I want to turn the code downwards uh, to the actual philosopher routines, which is a little bit of girth here. Uh, so I can fit just about all of this on a page at once. Um, the first thing that you'll want to look at uh, is up top, uh, we're going to see the random number generator uh, for this process. Uh, this is to create random delays so that as uh, we emulate this, you'll see a philosopher pause for a little while. Uh, that's this sleep for a short time here. And to prevent all philosophers from sleeping for the same amounts of time and trying uh, hard to sort of do things at the same time, if you give uh, each uh, process here a slightly different seed for its random number generator, and here you see it's based on the philosopher number up here, uh, then you'll get slightly different delays. Uh, that means every run is a little bit different on this uh, but it's supposed to be sort of stochastic in nature to prove that under a wide array of circumstances you don't get any deadlock or live lock here. The second bit then, uh, aside from seeding RAM non generator, so we get different delays for each uh, um, uh, philosopher, uh, is that we'll establish an index for what the first utensil and the second utensil uh, that each uh, philosopher is going to go for is. That generally if I'm the zeroth philosopher, I'll try to go for the zeroth utensil and then the oneth utensil. And importantly, we'll see that you always go in that order, uh, that the first utensil acquire, uh, that's this number, and the second utensil acquire is this number. The one change that we'll make is that the very last philosopher, uh, in this case, philosopher four, uh, that is uh, going to alter the order to break the cycle. This is where you see uh, that picture that we had over earlier, uh, where to avoid the cyclic nature, we'll have one of the philosophers, instead of going left, uh, go right uh, instead. And so the last philosopher here, the first utensil they'll attempt to acquire uh, is the zeroth, uh, and the second utensil uh, they'll attempt to require is the nth. Uh, and this is different uh, than uh, what the other philosophers would be. Uh, that if you're going along at home, this would be n and zero in terms of wrapping around. But reversing those two means that this philosopher goes right first and then left, versus all these go left and then right.
Uh, so that breaks the cycle and will prevent a deadlock. And this isn't just a little report from each of the uh, philosophers, Swanson's in this case, uh, about what utensils they're going to try to get in which order. Uh, so D and D here, the first utensil and the second utensil. And that'll follow a regular pattern except for the last one, which uh, has a reversal of the ordering that's going to get a pick. So then uh, the main loop here for philosophers is just to sleep for a little while to consider how awesome they are. And then to wake up and uh, indicate how many eggs they have eaten out of the maximum uh, that they're supposed to. Uh, so once you get to, I think it's 10 meals up here. Uh, yeah, 10 meals. Uh, so once we down here get to uh, 10 out of 10, uh, then these things will be finished. Uh, so the, the loop does not go on forever there. Uh, and after sort of contemplating their awesomeness, uh, then this sem weight call uh, is how the philosophers acquire one of the utensils. Sem weight is an interesting function and is worth pulling up just in the uh, manual page for it. So I'll do that here. You see man down here, sem weight. Uh, and if you do a little bit of reading on this, uh, then you'll see some discussion down here uh, that there's a decrement or a lock of the semaphore. Uh, and if you attempt to uh, acquire this thing, uh, some of which currently has a zero value, then call blocks until either it becomes possible to form the decrements uh, or a signal handle interrupts this. We won't deal with signals here and generally won't uh, deal with that complicating factor. So we're left just with this blocking part uh, that if uh, the one of the philosophers picks up this fork uh, uh, with the sem weight call, it will decrement to say there are zero utensils in that spot on the table now. And if another uh, some, uh, philosopher attempts to grab that, uh, then the, it will find that that spot is empty because the semaphore value is zero. And this will just block the process until the operating system sees that the semaphore has been returned, incremented back up. Uh, and this allows then uh, the blocked process to proceed uh, by acquiring it and preventing anybody else from getting it. So you see two of these in a row because we decided early on that all of the philosophers, they need to get two utensils. Uh, so Swanson is going to pick up the first utensil, get the second utensil, uh, and that allows them to eat. And this happens uh, fairly uh, quickly in, in that respect. Uh, and that Swanson's with two forks devour eggs very fast. Uh, to that end, then, after devouring, uh, the semaphore post function, uh, sem post, will release the semaphore. And this puts forks back down the table, will put them down in the order of first and then second on, on, on that front. Finally, then, there's a report that uh, those two utensils have been released, and we loop back around, presuming uh, that that wasn't the last meal that folks have eaten. Uh, after the number of meals to eat has been completed, uh, that's 10 in this case, uh, the swans will just report that they're leaving and then exit. And the exit here is significant because a return would put us back in the main function to execute code there. We don't want the child processes doing any cleanup on Senaphores. Uh, instead, we only want the parent process to do that. Uh, so this exit down here will kick us out of the process entirely by ending the whole program run. Uh, that isn't the whole program, it's just the child process ending. Let's have a look at how this thing plays out in, uh, in practice. Uh, so I need to come back up to the top here. I'm gonna grab the GCC that's up here. Uh, and you'll notice over here on the command line, uh, these, uh, this e um, inner process communication library uh, is part of the pthreads library in POSIX. And so attempting to compile uh, down here without that library linked, we'll get a bunch of undefined references to various uh, calls related to semaphores, uh, but instead uh, pushing on the library pthread, which contains definitions for those, uh, this allows compilation and linking to proceed uh, and is a sign then that IPC is baked into the operating system, uh, but it's not used in enough programs uh, for it to always be present and linked there. So if I run this uh, philosopher's program now, uh, what you'll see is a long sort of uh, output uh, set of stuff here uh, as Swanson's make uh, various like forays uh, forwards. And you see up here uh, that Swanson 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 report which uh, forks or utensils they want, uh, in which order. Uh, each of them check in, uh, and then the egg consumption begins. 
Uh, so you can see a general report here of Swanson's making gradual prog progress. Uh, for instance, uh, up here, it looks like uh, Swanson 2 is the first one uh, to get uh, the two utensils, uh, and then it's eating egg zero and then releasing them. Uh, the output here like, is not entirely reflective of what's going on because in most cases, each of these uh, Swansons is actually an independent process. And so much of this stuff can be happening sort of um, uh, in parallel together. Uh, eventually, over many sort of outputs, you can see progress is made along these ways until uh, Swanson 2 leaves the diner, uh, Swanson 3 leaves the diner after eating tag, uh, 10 eggs, and, and so on down the line, until the last Swanson, Swanson 0, leaves the eggs. We have a short pause here, uh, with, along with a suggestion to sort of look at what's going on uh, in the file system, but I'm going to ignore that for the moment and uh, just punch enter here. So uh, this is generally then a proof of concept uh, that at least in this case, we got the, all of the Swansons fed, uh, maybe not exactly fairly, uh, but by the time others are leaving, at least Swanson Zero can uh, make his way uh, to getting eggs. Uh, you can see he gets sort of three quick ones at the end here, um, uh, which maybe is a sign that he was a little bit starved at the beginning. Since there are uh, sort of, uh, they're subject to the uh, whims of the scheduler here. No run of these two or this program is going to look exactly the same before um, as the last one. So I run this again. Uh, we'll see slightly different output over here with the different seatings. We still got uh, more or less the same um, outputs at the end where Swanson Zero is the last one to leave. But uh, compared to uh the last run let's see so down here we have uh swanson zero and swanson one being the last two uh but up here uh let's see i need to find uh where i invoked that uh last time okay uh it was a uh, swanson zero and swanson four ending so there are a lot of uh sort of timing issues here but we'll uh, create sort of uh i wouldn't say unreliable but unpredictable orderings of what you see over here uh, and to that end, that's not the point. Uh, it's also not the point that after two runs here, we got completion uh, that this works. Instead, you need to go to some mathematical proofiness in order to show definitively that yes, all Swansons are eventually going to eat in this case. Uh, that's beyond the scope of what we're gonna discuss here. Uh, but the intuitive reasoning that we used, uh, that we're breaking the cycle and so we'll at least make forward progress uh, for some of the philosophers, uh, that is an important facet here and the sort of central underlying uh, mechanism. Also, uh, to, gener uh, to demonstrate some of the semantics associated with this um, uh, semaphore business. Uh, now, there's one other trick uh, that I want to show uh, associated with this. Uh, up at the top of the source code is a suggestion over here of something you can do. I have to do this in an actual terminal. Um, but over here, uh, I have a sort of complicated invocation that's going to allow me to actually see that this is not one process uh, working to produce all this output. It's actually several processes. Uh, so this I'll copy into an actual terminal because uh, I need terminal uh, control for it and Emacs doesn't provide it. Uh, and if I paste this in here, uh, this semi-complicated uh, invocation does the following. It starts up the philosopher's program, but puts all the output into this little XXX file. Common name for temp files is like something towards the end of the output so that it shows up at the end of an LS. Uh, I'll then run the watch program, which will repeatedly run some other program, uh, this time at intervals of tenths of seconds, uh, so I can see like updates uh, to those programs. And the program I want to run is actually a combination is uh, do a process listing for all the processes that I own that are executing, and grep for philosophers. This is going to show uh, that there uh, are several philosopher programs running at once, uh, and they finish at different times, although fairly close together. So as I punch enter, this is going to, on the command line, start up some uh, process and simultaneously start up a watch process, uh, which will, as uh, child processes, look for these philosophers programs. It looks something like this. Uh, so you can see here each of the philosophers that's uh, running here. We got a few of them finished, uh, and then I'm uh, done, and all I have left is the, the uh, grep for those uh, philosophers here. can kill this thing. Uh, they have this philosophers thing uh, trapped in the background, so I'll bring that forward, and so I'll punch enter to finish it. Uh, if we'll do it one more time uh, just to sort of see here. Up, You see all of the philosophers up here, uh, and then that uh, they end so that those are the child philosopher processes, here's the parent process that's going to do cleanup on this, this front. 
Uh, this watch utility is useful, uh, particularly because it allows you to watch what's going on in a system and limit that to specific uh, programs. It's sometimes a little more easy uh, to manage than a top invocation. Uh, but you can get largely the same effect uh, there. Uh, for instance, if I run a top over here, let's see. Uh, oh, rats. Uh, let's see, I need an actual shell, not the one that was inspired by Emacs here. So here's a top. Uh, and over here, if I fire up Emacs in a shell, uh, you should briefly see uh, some philosophers like up here, although they don't take a lot of CPU. So yeah, I guess you can't even see it up there. But that's unfortunate. But, so uh, at any rate, uh, I digress on that front. There's one other thing that is interesting to look at here, and it's a suggestion uh, from this little bit uh, down here. Uh, while you're waiting, as in uh, right before we clean up, there's a... Uh, a chance to look in the following directory, uh, dev slash me. Uh, and so let's do that quick. Uh, I need a second terminal for it. So I'll pull one up uh, over here. Uh, and if I list what's in there, uh, you'll see some familiar characters. Uh, sem.utensil0, uh, utensils1, uh, utensils2, and so on. These things that are present in here uh, are actually named after the names that I pick for those semaphores. Uh, and if I do a long listing over here, uh, you'll see that these look more or less like regular files. They're not. They're actually sort of a special kind of device associated with uh, the operating system semaphores. But to allow unrelated processes to access the same set of semaphores, they have a spot on the file system, according to the shared memory file system uh, paradigm that uh, Linux lays out. So on that front, uh, this is kind of like the paradigm that was established with FIFOs, where if you want two unrelated processes to be able to access some system resource, put them on the file system someplace. Now, once I press enter here, there's some cleanup code that's gonna be run. Uh, and if I list again uh, what was in there, uh, it's nothing anymore. So let's look just quickly at that cleanup code uh, that's done uh, in here at the end of the philosopher main uh, code. That's down here in this last loop, where the philosopher uh, sort of parent process that spun up the little ones that are competing for forks and so forth, uh, it will close this, those uh, semaphores uh, and then unlink them. And this sem unlink business is very much like a file remove. It may be the case that you could actually use a standard file remove to get rid of those. I'm not entirely certain on that front, but there is a prescribed sem unlink function that works in the same way. You need the name for uh, the semaphores as well to get rid of it. Uh, now, if I comment out this part uh, and recompile uh, over here, find that GCC, and rerun this thing, it'll take just a second for this to spin through, uh, but once it does, I'll press enter. Uh, and if I, in my second shell over here, uh, list what's in there, you'll see that since I didn't unlink it, those semaphores are still present in the file system. Uh, and this is interesting because they can live beyond the scope of what a program does. Very much in the way that if you make a FIFO uh, then, and don't remove it by the end of the program, it can outlive the program. This will be important because for some kinds of system resources, it may be the case that the semaphore has to live longer than any program managing at that, and uh, the semaphore has to be there as a program starts to indicate presence uh, and availability or absence of a resource availability. So uh, to summarize just a few things and bring us back uh, to our uh, slide set over here. Uh, some things to sort of see there are to create semaphores, which function very much like atomic locks uh, that represent those forks. You first need to open them up. That's a creation uh, mechanism. Uh, importantly, that is very much like a file open uh, with flags that give permissions and creation semantics similar to, to files. Uh, this notion of a name semaphore then uh, gives you a spot on the file system that you can actually make use of it. Importantly, you also need to initialize in here. The two main functions to use here are wait until the semaphore is available, and once it is, decrement it so it's not available or locked after that. And once you're finished using a semaphore, uh, to post it. Uh, and I think this reflects to some extent uh, the flag uh, semantics over here, uh, that you wait until the flag intakes um, safety, and then you um, uh, the flag will chain state to indicate on the other side of this track that no one should go through this thing. 
and once you pass through, you post uh, to return the flag to sort of it's safe to go through here kinds of state, allowing others to pass through. Finally, and to get rid of uh, the program sort of utilization of uh, those semaphores, you close it up. Although in most cases, like many operating system resources, uh, the OS, if you exit without closing, will probably do it automatically. Uh, that goes for files as well, but it's good hygiene to close up any resources like files and semaphores before uh, exiting a program. The dining philosophers part of this thing then showed the use of semaphores to represent these shared resources, uh, utensils. Uh, philosophers acquire both adjacent utensils before eating, and that means calling this sem wait function twice in a predictable order. Uh, and this prevents that circular deadlock that we were afraid of uh, by breaking the cycle uh, by having the last philosopher, philosopher N, get the right utensil first and then the left utensil. All the philosophers go left, right, uh, and this means there's no cycle possible in terms of resource acquisition. So the last thing I want to relate to this uh, um, problem of dining philosophers is <laughs> uh, a bit of an admission. Uh, I have been curious for a long time what uh, the practical applications of the dining philosophers problem is. Uh, if you do a little reading uh, out there about practical applications for this one, uh, you'll probably see lots of spots uh, that are associated with uh, stack overflow posts that essentially say there isn't one. Now, this is a model problem. It's simplified for pedagogical services, uh, uh, pedagogical purposes, uh, so that you can easily see sort of a real world scenario uh, that has shared resources, but generally you don't have circular arrangements like this in actual computing platforms. Uh, but they do demonstrate then the need for locks uh, and motivate it and show uh, how you can, uh, at least in theory, uh, break these cycles and make forward progress. We will look at some more practical problems as we move ahead and also contrast semaphores uh, with some other more convenient uh, IPC mechanisms uh, such as the message queues, which uh, fold several of those ideas into uh, one. But look for that uh, in the not too distant future. Um, there is an alternative to the uh, POSIX semaphores that we looked at. If you are so inclined, you can look at the system5 directory in today's code pack. Uh, if you look over here uh, in the code pack for today, you'll see that uh, philosophers POSIX here. There's a series of programs in here, which I don't maintain as well anymore, uh, but this philosophers sys5 and its variants uh, are present in there. Uh, the system five semaphores are kind of weird because whenever you get a semaphore, you actually get a whole array of semaphores. Uh, and this is interesting in that you can uh, operate on the entire array atomically rather than individually, uh, incrementing and decrementing uh, multiple semaphores at once. But this involves some very interesting semantics where you have to have structs that describe the operations and so forth. And um, it's generally just sort of a little clunkier um, versus the POSIX approach is very, very straightforward. You have single functions that uh, uh, acquire and release uh, them. Uh, so look at those if you're so inclined and expect to see some things that look a little bit different. The one thing I will say about the System 5 Sem 4s is that they're interesting in that they have a few other use uh, semantics. Uh, for instance, you can form other kinds of synchronization, uh, synchronization uh, for instance, having a bunch of processes uh, wait until a Sem 4 reaches zero. So they essentially can all check in and then uh, block until everyone arrives at the table. That's not as easy or maybe even as possible with POSIX stuff. Uh, and that kind of barrier semantics shows up uh, at times in parallel programming. But the net effect overall is generally the same, uh, that you're able to allow the philosophers using those system five semaphores uh, to communicate and coordinate their resources. Uh, we'll uh, talk next time about some of the nature of what it means to be a, a semaphore. Uh, and generally, we're going to look at an alternative later on when we study um, uh, threads, uh, and that is the notion of a mutex, uh, which is short for mutual exclusion. Generally, a semaphore is sort of like uh, having an integer value, uh, usually, usually a one or a zero, although you can uh, cause these things to have bigger values than one or zero to acquire, uh, mention, uh, sort of indicate, oh, this resource allows more than one thing uh, process to acquire it. 
but some sort of locking mechanism that the operating system has to provide. And then internally, there's a wait queue uh, that's behind the scenes of a semaphore. Uh, if there are three folks waiting for that semaphore uh, to be released, then they usually go into some sort of a wait queue. Uh, and this convenience mechanism then is something that we can build uh, ourselves uh, if you're so inclined, as long as you had access to that locking mechanism. Uh, we'll see this later on that uh, there's the notion of a condition variable that's essentially just the wait queue part of this. Uh, and mutexes are essentially the locking part of this. Uh, so to that end, uh, adding an integer to it uh, allows you to essentially recreate the magic of semaphores using these other devices that we'll talk about in the context of threads. Uh, but generally, semaphores are a very convenient mechanism, and uh, although associated with inter-process communication, can also be used for uh, coordinating threads, although we'll see that mutexes are much more common for that later on. All right, that's probably enough uh, for the moment. Uh, have a look uh, going ahead at some of the rest of the material that we'll be studying. Uh, very soon we'll look at message queues and shared memory as well. Uh, but make sure that you have a good understanding of semaphores as they're likely to count for our final project of the semester. Uh, although uh, that's now what would have been project three will now be called project two. And it will involve inter-process communication uh, in several different ways. Uh, until I see you on Wednesday, I hope you're all happy and healthy, and uh, get some programming in if you can. See you then.